Okay, so I'm changing my talk. <laughs> and, and this talk I gave uh, to um, uh, a group at UC Riverside, and it was of Native artists and, and um, museum people. And it was to shoot or not to shoot. And it is about identity also. How's that? <laughs> OK. To shoot or not to shoot, you're shooting the wrong way, not from this perspective. Sometimes when we're taken into institutions or we're taken into groups, we're always expected to see the same perspective of everyone else. And sometimes that institution has a different perspective than we do. And that perspective looks at us as an object. And they don't, they don't um, pay attention to that. In my career as a photographer, one of my identities as a photographer before becoming a professor and a museum director, for 30 years I witnessed my community. I witnessed my community, its resilience. Because as we know, the history, there's a general history that everybody knows about the United States and the indigenous people. The resilience is incredible. Everybody always thinks it's gone. But it lives in my family. It lives in the thoughts of the artist. It lives in the thoughts of our writers, our thinkers. They are still there. And they are resisting. This is an image taken at a protest. And so people say, well, you've been protesting. You were influenced by the uh, civil rights movement. We were protesting before that. And they said, well, um, you were probably protesting since the 20s when, when there were riots in Oklahoma. We were protesting before that. We were protesting when there were this exchange, exchange of gifts on Manhattan when we were given beads and, you know, nothing was thought big of it. That's what you do. You go visit, you take a gift. But what wasn't in the thought that land was being given for that gift or that an island was being given for that gift, it was part of reciprocity. It was part of protocol. And so their perspective, the perspective was that of the visitor. And the visitor was taking as much as possible. When the visitor takes as much as possible, they end up eating the visitor, the, the, the host. And in eating the host, it seems as though the host never existed. Therefore, the host never protested. The host never, never, um, never gave a fight. Here, we continue to fight because even our image is being eaten. Our image on professional sports teams. The young ones go out to fight. And I take my camera to, to document to do document our resilience. I document when we stand up, when the other tribes call for help. When Standing Rock put out the call and said, we need, we need help. We need people to protest for us. In San Francisco, um, in 2016, our organizers got together, went to the federal building, made a call out on social media, and we stood up. The standing up is all over the United States. It may be in numbers that are small. This is Bear Butte, Matupaha, in South Dakota. 
The man sitting down is a descendant of Red Chief Red Cloud. They were protesting because a mega bar was going to be put near Matapaha. Matapaha is significant, a place to go for visions, prayers. I'm going to go over this one. Let's see. <coughs> Hang on. I'll go back to it. So the thing is that we have, we have as an as a indigenous community, we have the same perspective of fighting for what we've lost, what we're regaining, what's wrong. Um, but sometimes all of our community we, doesn't have the same perspective. Some of those are, have been Christianized, colonized, institutionalized. They have been brainwashed. And, it, and it's, it's, not, it's not a punishment to say, you know, you're not Indian anymore because there's no such word for United States, indigenous people. But this, this I put up as an example. This is my office in, um, at UC Davis. And on my office door, I had a, a, a poster of Lori Blondeau, Lonely Surfer Squaw. And, and she's an incredible uh, performance artist. And it's, it's a piece I really love. She's wearing a beaver uh, skin bikini. And I had it up, and, and you know, Lori had signed it, and I was very proud. And uh, one of the staff members came to me who was Ho-Chunk. And she hated the poster. She said, this is not what Native women are about. This is disrespectful. So I said, well, you know, Lori Blondeau is, is a performance artist who was significant and is, you know, changing ideas and, you know, I was going on and on about her different performances. She said, no, I don't like it. Um, so I received a complaint of, um, of uh, inappropriateness from the institution. And so I thought, well, okay, I'll, I'll take care of the poster. So I cut out little pieces and I put a little dress on her. <laughs> that really pissed her off. <laughs> so I was like, uh, and I thought, well, I t took care of the issue. And so the next thing I knew there was this, this big yellow thing over my poster. <laughs> And I was told by the institution, you know, that she was feeling sexually threatened. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll take it down. Because sometimes, sometimes when we think we're in unity in thought and when we think we're in unity, unity in decolonizing, we have to think about our community who's still trying to understand the word sovereignty. And that's not bad. What it does, it, it, it shows to us We've become an academic elite. And if we don't want to slow down and, and explain it, that even makes us worse. So that, 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 was, that was a lesson for me. That was a lesson for me in that when one looks at the community, you have to look at our, our different levels of knowledge are different levels of acceptance. Now, one of the things I really appreciate, and you know, this is part of the shoot, don't shoot. Um, the Australian, the Australian notices on um, films, ethnographic material. Um, the, the document contains names of deceased persons of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. It also contains some language that might be considered offensive. I always found that very respectful because in some of our uh, um, cultures in, in North America, especially the Na Navajo, you, you respect certain things. And of course, uh, death is a big thing, but also Recently, what happened was the eclipse. 
there, there's a holy thing that's happening within Navajo epistemology uh, with the eclipse, with the sun and the moon. You know, it, it's a very intimate um, uh, um, thing that is happening. And so the direction is you go inside, you sit down, and you wait respectfully. And then you come out, and you don't stare. And so being half Navajo, <laughs> I, I took um, um, photos of the eclipse, looking at my Tuskegee sites, which are sun worshipers. Um, but I put them on Facebook. But before I, before I posted them, I posted something like this to my Dene relatives. I said, I'm going to, I took some uh, photographs of the eclipse, but I want to warn you before I post them. And I, I'll post a couple more things up, and so it'll be hidden down in the pages. So this is a warning. Then about 15 minutes later, after posting some things that, you know, uh, I posted, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're within the page, so, you know, it's okay if you want to look at my page. And that, and that was very important because one of, one of the younger students in the audience at UC Riverside, you could hear her gasp because it's very real. It's very real, these teachings, if one even views the photographs. Now, one of the other things about shoot and don't shoot was that I'm, a, um, I'm pretty nomadic on the web. <laughs> I, I love traveling on the web. And, I, and I, I search for everything, and you know. And this is a very interesting thing I came across. And, and um, Terry Yonke and her company are uh, commissioned to do this, this, this lay ground for the ways that there's an indig indigenous roadmap in museums of protocol. And I thought that's re really interesting. <coughs> and in the, in, in the, in the um, protocols, the indigenous protocols, this is from a 2016, and it was a working uh, piece. And since then, they, they've uh, uh, even um, formed it more. Nine principles to be applied to a project respect, indigenous control, communication, consultation, and consent, interpretation, integrity, authentic authenticity, secrecy, confidentiality, attribution, copyright, proper returns, and royalties, continuing cultures, recognition, and protection. And like I said, they, they've, they've developed other aspects and other purposes, because this, this was done in 2016. And, and you can go online and, and, and find the updates. But it's, it's, it's a road map that they hope to put in the Australian museums concerning Aboriginal collections and people, along with staff. To me, that, that, that you know, I've been showing my uh, American friends to shoot or not to shoot, or to create or not to create, and who has the right to create? Who has the right to interpret? This is a recent um, uh, controversy at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis. Scaffold by uh, Sam Durant. So the, the Walker Art Center was increasing their sculpture garden and they, they commissioned Sam Durant. The um, director had seen his work at um, Documenta and um, thought it would be really a nice addition to the sculpture garden in Minneapolis without thinking the effect on the community. The Dakota, the Lakota, the surrounding indigenous communities. In 1862, in Mankato, Minnesota, as you can see, 
The scaffold looks very similar to the one in the painting. 38 Dakota men were sentenced to hang by Abraham Lincoln, the largest mass hanging in United States history. Two had escaped and were later hung. So the director, the director, and the, the I love this picture of them, they're very <laughs> uncomfortable. <laughs> the director and the artist, the artist teaches at Cal Arts down in Southern California. He has students. The director has been there a while and says, oh, you know, I guess we did overlook talking to the community. And, you know, and as you can tell by Sam Durant being uncomfortable, they really thought they could get this done without any criticism because they didn't see the community. They didn't see any need to uh, communicate. The, or, the community quickly organized. They quickly organized and they had meetings with elders, with the, with the youth, because when some of the youth would go near this, they would start crying, because they've heard of the stories. Some of their relatives were hung. And that's not that long ago. Um, the um, spiritual leaders came together to direct a resolution. Um, some of the very, um, the people who had so-called knee-jerk reactions wanted to burn it right there. But the spiritual leaders, who included uh, Orville Looking Horse, the Cheyenne, um, we need to think about this, and we need to approach it in a spiritual way. Because if it, we burn it, it's like burning our ancestors' memories. So we need to disassemble this, and we need to bury it properly. So it, it was it was buried. Now, <laughs> to shoot or not to shoot? I wish Jimmy was here. <laughs> and I saw some of his photographs outside. And I was showing this to, um, to, this, to the young artists, our native artists. I said, you know, when we do our art, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility, and we have a, that includes research. And um, we, um, it, it, it is a heavy responsibility. Jimmy's dream has always been to create awareness about our world's indigenous cultures through his photography. He has wanted to create a visual document that shows us and future generations the beauty of how they live. Like Edward Curtis, the famous American who documented the North American Indians, he wanted to create carefully orchestrated portraits of these amazing people, he needs a G there, at their absolute proudest. This is from his website. He's well-intentioned. Oh, the Maoris were pissed off at him. <laughs> Quite a few people were pissed off at him. And he goes on to state that you know, he, he's not a person who reads a lot. <laughs> so I was telling my this, the other artist, I said, you need, you need to read. <laughs> you need to do research. <laughs> and, um, and if one takes look, a look at his TED video online, <laughs> just take a look at it. I can't describe it. <laughs> so Jimmy is, is saving us. <laughs> he's, he's saving us. You know, and, and I know he, he probably means well, but you know, it, it's another deflection. It's another deflection from our presence, from the presence of our young artists, our elder artists, who are creating incredible work who are creating work that are layered. 
Though there was a um, redeeming part of Jimmy's, um, he, he started a foundation after he started getting a lot of flack for this. And he gave a, um, a, a fund to this photographer to photograph the Lumbee tribe. It's an Indian photographing an Indian. <laughs> so that comes to ethically sound work. Now it brings us back to indigenous cultural protocols in the arts. And when, as we look at these words, you know, and even, like I said, it, it was a work in projects. And they were applying it not only to museums and institutions, but they were applying it to music. They were applying it, they were applying it to any type of multimedia work that can be disseminated. So, I mean, how, you know, sometimes when I look at this list, it's like I can barely check off a lot of that, those lists. But if we took Jimmy's work and laid that on it, it would fail miserably. So, I think I'm going to uh, just show you one more uh, set of images in this extemporaneous speech. Uh, can I have help? Yeah, the other way. And what I'm going to show you um, are images I took um, at Standing Rock. And hopefully they're on this one. I'm pretty sure they're on the other one. OK, so, so my, my other identity being um, uh, the director of the C.N. Gorman Museum at uh, U University of California, Davis, and a professor. And um, of course, my wife is the curator too. And Amari, he 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 works overtime too. And um, so, when Standing Rock was happening, we decided to do a, a exhibition on protest and prayer. Because one of the things is that you have to combine the two, and we that's how we've been directed. So we asked artists who who had visited and who, um, who were active within uh, Standing Rock to contribute. We had uh, work by Melanie Cervantes and Jesus Barraza. And you might recognize the Solidarity, um, if you were online, the Solidarity uh, poster that they took their screen printing equipment to Standing Rock and printed there, and also just printed at different sites. And they've been screen printing through the community. And they'll, what they'll do also is they'll go to the protest and they'll, they'll screen uh, print posters. And they I mean, might be another poster from another uh, something, utilizing recycling poster paper, and just hand them out. This is Jean, Jean Melcellinus. And she's uh, uh, from the Pacific. And she was photographing the incarcerated in California. And because they were not immune to what was happening at Standing Rock. And in the Standing Rock, they were making protest art. They were making protest art within the prison. <coughs> we had uh, other faculty uh, participate with video. Um, uh, Tiffany Adams with paintings. Her nephew went to Standing Rock. He wasn't political before, but when he went, he realized his responsibility. And he put together an installation. This is what he, um, one needed at Standing Rock in order to, um, to take care of oneself. A gas mask, Philip's magnesia, if you've got tear gas in your eyes, um, your, your tobacco to give uh, thanks, um, uh, your sacred items. Uh, some cash to make your phone call. <laughs> um, looking at First Nations and First Nations art addressing uh, residential schools. Um, Andy Everson. Now, one of the things about some of this art is that it's online and it's downloadable because they want it to be out there. 
They want people to know about this. So Andy Everson does a lot of this type of art. Again, this is for um, uh, the residential um, children. Also, um, when um, uh, marriage was uh, um, recognized, gay marriage was recognized, Andy Everson also put out a uh, symbol for that. Let's see. Sarah Dilley, one of our students, who basically addressed uh, landscape and water. Again, another Andy Everson, which you probably recognize from the I Don't Know More movement. Very, you know, really got out there. Deborah Ayal's painting. But I'm going to jump to Water is Life. Um, Isaac Murdoch and Christy Belcourt who go around and um, they take, they just have a van and they go to different cities and they, um, they do screen printing sessions. And the last uh, action they did that I know of was uh, in San Francisco. They painted a huge mural on the road in front of a Wells Fargo bank with, with um, um, chemical free paint. Okay, I'm going to get quickly to I just want you to see some of the images and I'll get to um, Standing Rock. Because there's, there's this one of the things about Standing Rock. This is the beginning of Standing Rock. When we got there, we put our, our phone numbers on our arms because we went in, in um, response to the call when the Army Corps was going and the governor had ordered the evacuation of the camps. And if anybody helped the camp to, to exist, they would be fined $1,000 and the campers would be forcibly removed on, December, on November 5th. Or was it, yeah. So we go, we go in. It's a clear day. Because we're elders, we get to stay at the casino. <laughs> There's all these ironies, it's great. <laughs> as you, as you, as you, um, as you uh, go in, there is the direct actions of principles to follow. So I was with L. Frank Manriquez, who's a veteran. She was answering the call that Wesley Clark Jr. had put out. And the week, the middle of November, they had um, raised about $2,000 and had the commitment of about maybe 300 veterans to go. And L. Frank is a veteran from the Air Force. And um, so, because there was a call, you know, let's make a stand. So, you know, I, I left my class and I said, well, you're not going to have a final. And they were really sad about that. And um, I said, I'm going to Standing Rock. And they clapped. <laughs> so, um, so our first day there, which was December 4th, it was December 4th, L. Frank checks in, um, is, is uh, talking to friends and, you know, connecting. 4,000 veterans came. They were only expecting 300. There was the itinerary, which was, of course, blown away in the snowstorm, meeting other veterans, women veterans. Elle Frank made her own flag, because you got to have a flag. <laughs> and watching um, several of the veterans do their little marches to the front line. Meeting with the, the young Red Rope Warriors. And then heading back in the evening, thinking, tomorrow I'll take more pictures. And the people were still coming in to, to support Standing Rock. They have estimated about 25,000 people there on December 4th. 
that grew from about 3,000. And again, you know, 4,000 of them were veterans. And so we thought we were going to follow that little itinerary. But that night, a snowstorm came in. And, and it's always been in my thought, you know, these casinos, this, these casinos, you know, eventually they'll, they'll outlive their use and they'll become community centers. And that night it did. That night it became a community center because the storm was so fierce. They started bringing up some of the protest, water protesters up to the casino so they could sleep in the hall. So the itinerary for the veterans changed also. And what happened is that um, there was a forgiveness ceremony. Yeah, I was listening to the words about the apologies. But there was a, they, but the, the community set up a forgiveness ceremony for the soldiers. And Wesley Clark Jr.'s a family is very, um, their military history goes back to that in the 7th Cavalry, which uh, you know, included um, Little Bighorn. And so the spiritual people said, you know, there's a reason for this huge storm, and we're all supposed to uh, uh, gather in this, this pavilion. So we're going to have a forgiveness ceremony for you. This is what you're going to do. And they instructed uh, Wesley and his group. And uh, Wesley had to stand for about two hours while they were talking to him and instructing him and things like that. That's, that's what you do. <laughs> and, um, and then he, he, uh, people asked him, said, well, how did you know what you were going to say? He said, I really didn't know what I was going to say. But I was so moved. And this is what he said when he was talking to Leonard Crow Dog. Many of us particularly, me particularly, are from the units that have hurt you over the many years. We came, we fought you, we took your land, we signed treaties that we broke, we stole minerals from your sacred lands, we blasted the faces of our presidents onto your sacred mountains. When we, when we still took still more land, and when we took your children, and then we tried to take your language, and we tried to eliminate your language that God gave you and the Creator gave you. We didn't respect you. We polluted your earth. We've hurt you in so many ways, but we've come to say that we are sorry. We are at your service and we beg your forgiveness. The whole, all of it, there were tears everywhere. It is only now I can say these words without crying. It was amazing. Because it, it, it was genuine. The spiritual people were there, and those representatives of the military and those who had served. The speeches went on more. Arvel looking whores, um, Paula Horn, Ivan Looking Horse, Leonard Crow Dog, it was, um, uh, Faith Spotted Eagle. It was, it was a pretty heavy crew there. Because I, when I went to Standing Rock, Mrs. L. Frank, I was thinking, how am I going to take a photograph that hasn't been taken before? There's so many cameras here. There's so many uh, video cameras, media cameras, you know. So I followed Elle Frank, and I followed her journey as a veteran. The veterans were ready to fight, because that's what they were trained to do. They were trained to fight. And the spiritual leaders talked them down and said, we are here to pray. And when the announcement had been made by Obama that the uh, pipeline was to be um, um, on hold to look at alternative 
uh, uh, lines, um, places. Um, a prayer had been answered that had been asked a year before at a Sundance. And they said, now the prayer has been answered. We, we will to extinguish the fire, Ocheti Sakawin, because that prayer has been answered. You don't make amendments. It's, oh, by the way, I'd like to add this, A, B, and C. The prayer, the initial prayer had been answered. And so the, the spiritual people were saying to the younger people who still wanted to fight, and, and we need them badly, said, now go home and fight this fight in your own territory. Everybody needs clean water. Everybody needs respect. These are the cards when they were bringing up the, the protectors from the camp. The winds were 65, 70 miles per hour. We were stuck there for three days. And in that, the staff at the casino were stuck in their positions for three days as service. Not only that, I went up to these elderly people. I said, are you guys here for the protest? And they said, no, we, we just caught the bingo bus. <laughs> Fixed the victims of circumstance. <laughs> this is the pavilion. These are the halls. Everybody was sleeping everywhere. It's one of our famous movie stars. <laughs> He covered his head after I. And then I'm going to end with this one because students were there. You know, everybody had come in for that, for that, what we thought was going to be violence. Students had come in from UCLA. And so they weren't fighting tear gas. They weren't fighting dogs or things like that. They were helping the young Native women hotel service help make the beds for the rest of the community to sleep. The alliance was there, but the task had changed. The task isn't always as we think it is. It isn't always heroic. It isn't always photographable. It could be helping someone make a bed. Thank you. <laughs>